big uh, welcome up to Paul Berman. Thanks. Um, okay, that was really fun. Now let's talk about climate change. That's. <laughs> Um, so I've spent the last, uh, well, almost 30 years now um, trying to figure out how to make change. If you care about an issue and it keeps you up at night and it's like the only thing you keep seeing when you look on the news and what do you actually do? Um, and when I first started this journey, I was thinking I was going to become an academic. I was doing my master's in environmental studies and thinking about a law degree. And somehow I ended up here on the West Coast and um, uh, blockading logging operations is what happened, actually. And um, I ended up organizing logging blockades in Clackwood Sound on Vancouver Island. I was in my early 20s. And um, at the end of that summer of logging blockades, some of you will remember it, I hope. Um, <laughs> uh, I met a guy recently, and we were discussing his PhD thesis, and, and, he, and, and he said, um, I always wished I could have come to Clackwood Sound to the blockades. And I said, why didn't you? And he was said, I wasn't born. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, let's get my cane. And <laughs> anyways, the end of that summer, um, some of you will know, I was charged with 857 counts of criminal aiding and abetting and faced six years in jail. Um, I never went back to university uh, after that. It kind of started my trajectory. I didn't end up going to jail. The judge threw it out of uh, court. Um, you can't aid and abet civil disobedience, which that judge realized, thank goodness. People make their own hard decisions. And at the end of that summer, all these people had gone to jail. I'd gone to jail. I was exhausted. Everyone was exhausted, and the logging just continued. And I just tried, you know, I was just really wanting to figure out, well, so what actually makes change? And, and how do you do it? Um, and so that journey has taken me to a lot of places. I have um, been an advisor for governments, most recently Premier Notley, the Alberta government. I was chair of, a co-chair of the Oil Sands Advisory Committee designing climate legislation for Alberta. Um, then I was basically run out of Alberta. Um, and uh, I worked um, with Christy Clark's government uh, designing a climate leadership plan, which she never adopted. Um, and those two experiences um, led me back to campaigning and trying to figure out how do you organize people so that you have the power for decision makers to care, basically. Because we can all do a lot in our daily lives, and many of us are, um, but the problems that we now face as a result of the cumulative impacts of industrial society uh, on the planet are bigger than we are. And so, you know, you were told recycle and turn the heat down and buy an electric car if you can avoid, if you can afford it and all of those things. And they're so small in comparison to the issues that we have at hand. So yes, buy better light bulbs, but what we really need are better laws. And what I've learned over the past now 30 years, but really in the last decade of working on climate change is that we have the technology to make the changes that we need to make. And when governments change laws because they think they'll have support from, in doing that, from people like you and I, when they change those laws, um, that changes uh, a lot of things very quickly. So it's, a, it's not just obviously legislation, it's also there's an interplay that changes things. It's technology, it's laws, it's finance, but policy affects all of that. It creates certainty. And so I've decided, and most of my work now focuses on um, changing policy and changing corporate behavior. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about what, how to do that or what that means uh, for us right now in Canada um, as we face is issues of climate change. Oh, that should have been up while I was talking. Yeah. Um, that's me. Um, so. It's funny, I've been doing talks on climate change now for, well, I guess I started in 2003, so a long time ago. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's changed so much because I was really talking about what could happen for a really long time. And it's much harder now. Um, and I think that's one of the most important things I can tell you is that it's happening now. There has been a debate, um, a so-called debate, we now know um, that uh, that debate was funded. 
So I don't know if any of you have heard about the Exxon New case, but there is now uh, um, several lawsuits against Exxon and other major oil companies because like the tobacco companies before them, when they found stuff out early on in the 50s and 60s that meant that that product had to change and that we needed to change really the, it, the whole mechanisms of industrial society, they didn't want anybody to know that. And so they spent a lot of time covering it up. So now New York State is suing Exxon. There's, there's many, many, many lawsuits um, on this issue now just emerging. But what we know is that question, is climate change happening, that has been my whole adult life, um, was in fact something that was created. So what I know from uh, working at the United Nations Climate Change Conferences and with some of the leading scientists from around the world is that the majority of the world's uh, scientists, they say now say 97% agree. Climate change is happening. It's happening for a very simple reason. It's happening because of greenhouse gases getting trapped in the atmosphere. So we can debate the solutions all we want and what we do, but the fact is that it's being trapped kind of like a blanket and it's smothering the earth and that's creating extreme weather. Heat in some places, cold in other places, extreme fires. So we are living it now in British Columbia, especially um, actually uh, we're seeing a lot of it on the west coast quicker than we thought. A report came out just last two weeks ago that said that Canada is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world and, and, and faster than many people thought. So it's April. And there are 19 wildfires already burning right now in British Columbia. The last two seasons in British Columbia have been the worst uh, wildfires um, that have ever happened. Um, it's costing us billions of dollars. It's costing lives. There are already people being evacuated today. And of course, it's not just fires. Today in Montreal, people are being evacuated because of floods. Um, it's all over the world. So we've seen about a 70% increase in the severity and frequency of violent storms in the last 30 years. And, and we're going to see a lot more of it. This uh, report just came out um, uh, on droughts uh, just last week in China. 66 million people now in impacted uh, by droughts. Um, so in some places, um, it's um, getting hotter, in some places it's getting um, uh, drier, in some places it's getting wetter, but what we know is it's increasing way quicker than anyone thought. So climate change um, is now the greatest threat humanity has ever faced. More people uh, lose their homes today as a result of climate change than war. We know that major storms, when this to first report that I ever read in 2005 on extreme weather came out, major storms had increased about 50% in, dur in duration and intensity, now about 70%. Just last year, this uh, uh, new report came out uh, by the IPCC. It was really funny. When it came out, <laughs> Trump said, I want to know who drew it. Well, I... I'm not really sure who drew it, um, but I do know that it's the work of, um, it's uh, over 6,000 scientists from 192 countries, um, that it has been peer reviewed in all of those countries. And in fact, our country and all of those countries have signed off on the results. So what that usually means for a scientific paper when it goes through that kind of rigor is that it's extremely conservative because it had to get everyone's agreement. So what this extremely conservative report says is that the next um, five to 10 years, um, really matter, and that, in fact, if we don't change the trajectory of how much greenhouse gas emissions, carbon, that we're putting into the atmosphere really quickly, um, by, within 11 years, um, it will be out of control. So there's a point where we've melted so much ice on the planet, sea ice, that, there, it, that there's no longer a reflective surface for the sun, and the planet just keeps warming. When I talked to Dr. James Hansen about this from NASA, who, he, he said, Sephora, it's like this. That, at that point, you could just ban all cars from the planet and it wouldn't matter. Climate change would just keep increasing. So that's the tipping point that everyone talks about. Um, and what we know right now is that the trajectory we're currently on, even at two degrees, the report says, we'll see severe and widespread impacts on unique and threatened ecosystems, substantial species extinction, acidified oceans, large risks to global and regional food security, and the combination of high temperature and humidity compromising normal human activities. At one point, I found this throwaway line, the ability of the Earth to support human well-being is now in question. And I remember sitting there reading it going, did that just say, okay, 
And with, at the current trajectory, within 30 years, as temperatures rise, the biggest cities in the Middle East and, South and Southeast Asia will be lethally hot. The disintegration of West Antarctic's ice sheet will threaten all of the world's coastal cities with inundation. Tens of millions of people will be fleeing extreme heat, droughts, and floods. So that's the trajectory that we're currently on. So what are we going to do about it? You've heard a lot about the Paris Accord um, and the United Nations climate change negotiations. All the countries in the world get together and they negotiate about the space that's left in the atmosphere. Who gets to pollute what? That's what basically happens there. So when that happened and we reached the historic accord at Paris, countries finally agreed we're going to do something about it, and they made pledges to about here. So we currently have policies in the world that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, if they work, to about three degrees of warming. Most of what was on that slide that I just read is at two degrees of warming. We're already a little, about, about a, a little over a degree. The current trajectory of emissions is this big gray thing somewhere between four and six degrees, which most scientists say means that most of the planet is uninhabitable by about 2100. So we need to get to down here, which is a safe climate, below two degrees. Um, but the pledges in Paris don't get us there yet, so why? Primarily because of this. We're actually doing pretty well. We're phasing out coal globally. Canada's doing great, thanks to the Trudeau government. Phasing out coal, that's really important. And you often hear people talk about renewable energy and electricity when they talk about climate change. So that's important. That's an energy use. But because we focus so much on electricity and, and changing the, elect the way that we power electricity, what's happened is that um, we haven't focused on oil and gas. And so the result is oil and gas is growing very quickly and the emissions from the oil and gas sector are growing very quickly. <laughs> There's a great article and I think it was yesterday's uh, Globe and Mail um, where it talks about the new oil and gas campaign to, 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 I think it was called the miracle of oil and gas. And, and there, so the oil and gas sector is hard at work to convince people that because we currently use oil and gas, we have no choice, we have to continue to use oil and gas. If you dig into their reports like I have, if you read the Shell reports, for example, their projections of how much they're going to produce are based on the idea that we will fail to address climate change. So they say, we'll fail to address climate change. Yes, it's happening. We're going to get to a four to six degree world, but people will still use oil, so it might as well be ours. So right now we know if we just add up how much carbon is already dug up from the earth, we know that we have enough coal, oil, and gas already above the earth and currently in production or construction to take us past two degrees. So if it's all burned, we're past safe climate limits. And right now, this is the industry's plans. So if you add up what, the, what reserves they want to get at, um, then we're well, well past uh, two degrees. So I've been focusing a lot of my work on ending the expansion of oil and gas and trying to look at where is the industry expanding and why um, and how do, you, how do you constrain that. So a lot of scientists and International Energy Agency, even Mark Carney, the governor of Bank of Inla England, who's the former governor of, Canada's, um, of the uh, Bank of Canada, the vast majority of fossil fuel reserves are unburnable if global temperature rises are to be limited below two degrees. We need to, he later went on to say we need to keep two-thirds of the reserves in the ground. The problem is everyone, including Canada, and I just recently was in Ottawa meeting with, with several go unnamed government officials, they will say, yes, the world uses less oil, we believe in climate change, but the world's going to use some oil, so it might as well be ours. So everyone is saying that, and although we now have some regulations and agreements about who gets to burn what, we don't yet have agreements on who gets to dig up what and produce what. So we need to regulate supply and stop the expansion as well as um, uh, stop the emissions. So actually this shows you Canada. This is what we're doing on emissions in Canada. This is projected to 2030. We're doing again pretty good on coal, pretty good on electricity oil and gas um, is growing. So this, many of you will know, is the Alberta tar sands. Uh, this is where I've done a lot of my work in the last 10 years. The tar sands lie below, um, one of the most important forests left on Earth. 80% of the world's uh, intact forests are already gone. We've got about 20% left on the planet. 
That's in Canada, Russia, and Brazil. So this intact forest that is kind of the crown of Canada, the boreal forest, is one of the most important forest ecosystems left in the world. Um, it's being literally dug up to get at the oil. So um, we have some of the largest trucks in the world digging up um, and trying to extract the oil from the sand. And that's why Canada's um, uh, oil is so carbon intensive, because um, it's not stick a drill down, get a gusher out, like a lot of oil from around the world. You actually have to pump steam or chemicals through the sand to separate the oil from the, stand, from the sand. So the result is Canada's oil is extremely heavy carbon and also high cost and quickly being costed out of the market. This is just another way of looking at pollution in Canada. So you can see pollution going down from coal power, from transport, all across the country from every industry and oil sands um, growing very quickly. So if we go on the trajectory we're going with the new climate framework that the Trudeau government has initiated, we uh, reduce pollution quite significantly from every aspect in Canada as a result of the carbon tax and the other measures except for oil and gas. And oil and gas gets to stay according to the current plans, which actually means that by 2050, uh, the far majority of all pollution in Canada uh, comes from the oil sands. What you don't understand until you start digging into these numbers is that's not actually possible. <laughs> if we're going to allow, if we're going to meet our targets and allow this much from the oil and gas sector, that means that every person here has to stop driving. Every person in Canada has to stop driving forever. So right now we're on a trajectory where we're just allowing pollution to rise from the oil and gas sector and from Alberta because it's a political hot potato and no one really wants to address it, but it's not sustainable. Globally, I work now, um, I've created a coalition of groups around the world who are working on this issue in all the countries uh, that currently produce oil and gas. Not all, but most. Um, and we're assessing where all the production is around the world. We hear a lot about how the problem is India, the problem is China, et cetera. This is the top 100 undeveloped oil and gas projects. We just mapped it um, predominantly uh, in North America. The US is now the biggest, um, and, and Canada is right next to the US in terms of potential oil and gas expansion. BC is huge for that fracking in the north, one of the largest gas uh, production areas potentially in the world. Um, so this is, I was asked to look at, so what are you trying to do? So this is it, just this. Um, to stop further expansion um, and investment in expansion um, within the next five years of oil and gas globally. That's what I'm working on. Um, I have uh, an organization that I work with called Stand.Earth and some amazing campaigners who are running uh, awesome campaigns with me and also uh, this new global gas and oil network that I chair. Um, and um, we're also working with unions and others around the world to try and figure out, as you phase out the production of oil and gas, how do you phase in um, a, a just transition? Um, and so this is our strategy. We're working around the world to raise money to support um, frontline communities, like here in Vancouver, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Squamish, who are opposing the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Up north, uh, the Wet'suwet'en, who are opposing the coastal gas link. Those frontline communities are at the front line of ensuring a safe climate. They're trying to stop expansion of the oil and gas sector. Will we have enough? We have more than enough right now. Because what we're seeing is, is new technologies come into place very quickly. Um, and they could be quicker if we had better uh, policies. And then we have to redefine climate leadership. That's it. In Canada, uh, we've already stopped or slowed down every single pipeline that has been proposed in the last uh, eight years, except for the Trans Mountain Pipeline from the oil sands. That's still proposed and the government says that they're making yet another decision on it on June 18th. So we'll see what they do. I'm a part of the Protect the Inlet Coalition. We've been organizing, um, uh, this was actually a picture from the Gateway Campaign in Prince Rupert. I love this picture because I think that might be all of Prince Rupert marching against the <laughs> gateway campaign. Um, but these campaigns are going on all across the country and in fact all over the world um, on gas pipelines, on oil pipelines. And I wanted to um, really sum up um, by giving you, um, uh, introducing you to some of the people that I've been working with up on Burnaby Mountain. Many of you know that the Tsleil-Waututh um, elders erected a watch house on top of Burnaby Mountain when construction started on the Trans Mountain Pipeline last year. I was helping them, um, Stand Out Earth was coordinating a lot of support with them, and we met the most amazing people. People just started showing up on the mountain, and 
um, getting arrested and protesting in front of the Trans Mountain Gates. And it was, uh, it was very moving, having worked on this for so long, to just see people arriving. You know, you put out a call and you do your text relay system and your Instagram or whatever the digital team does that I don't really understand. And, and, then, and then people show up. And there are all these amazing people show up. Um, so this is Reverend Laura Dykstra, the, um, an, an Anglican diocese from Westminster, New Westminster, who was arrested in front of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. This was an amazing day. This woman used to work for Trans Mountain, and she's an engineer. And she was just about to get arrested, and she turned to me and she goes, would it help if you knew that I'm, I used to work for Kinder Morgan, and I stopped because it was so scary what they were doing, and, and that this pipeline is not safe? And I was like, yeah, that helps. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so she ended up doing an enormous amount of media interviews, which was really, really amazing. She had an incredible story to tell. Um, the retired provincial government lawyer um, while she was being arrested, and of course, um, really uh, the moral center uh, of the movement, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, um, who's president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. It's been an incredible experience to work in coalition um, with the Tsleil-Waututh and the Squamish and the UBCIC, a lot of times um, I had different strategic ideas than they did about what we should do next. Um, and, um, you know, we normally make power maps and do analysis to figure out what to do next. Um, and they have prayer circles or talk to the elders, and that's what we did. And a lot of last year I felt like I was actually living reconciliation in process as we tried to um, develop this campaign together, but under their leadership, recognizing their land, and they're the most impacted. What I'm finding all over the world when I work on climate change is that it's the people who have been longest there, the people who are most marginalized, the people um, who are so struggling for their human rights, who have the greatest impacts from these oil and gas facilities and also from a changing climate. So it's been pretty awesome um, to work with them. So this is the first result of our big campaign, the Lofoten Declaration um, last year. Um, this was a declaration that we signed in Norway. We had this goal that 100 groups would join us with this audacious goal of stopping new oil and gas expansion around the world. And um, within uh, uh, two weeks, we had 800 organizations from around the world who had signed it and really kind of put the oil and gas industry on notice. It was followed up at Davos um, by a group of 80 of the world's leading economists taking our declaration, the words that we had written, um, and uh, releasing it at Davos, uh, uh, calling for no new investment in oil and gas. And since that time, um, this is some of the coalition that I'm working with internationally, since that time, um, uh, a lot has happened. Um, we have many countries who are now committing to ban new oil and gas exploration. These are all the ones uh, so far. We have hot debates, of course, in Canada, California, and many other producing countries, but we already have Belize, Costa Rica, France, um, and now Norway, um, uh, just last month, committed to not drill off the Lofoten Islands as a result of concerns about climate change. So it's a growing movement that is also bol bolstered by the fact that demand is changing very quickly. We have now um, uh, six countries that have all said they're going to ban the fossil fuel car. BC has as well. Thank you, British Columbia, and the most recent climate plan. And technological changes are happening so quickly, and the prices are plummeting of renewable energy. So it, the world is changing. I think that's what I want to leave you with. We have the technology to make the changes that we need to make. We know that we can use less oil and gas. And what we need is what we're starting to see, from Extinction Rebellion to the climate strikes to the thousands marching here in Vancouver. So if you're trying to figure out what you can do um, to, to be a part of this incredible change, I would say um, don't be shy uh, about joining this movement because a lot of the people that I met who marched up onto Burnaby Mountain and got arrested had never done anything like it before. You don't have to get arrested. You can volunteer a couple of hours for stand or Dogwood or Lead Now or any of the groups, the UB, Union of BC Indian Chiefs. You can write a check to support us when we're doing our organizing. Most importantly, you can vote and talk to your MLAs and your MPs about climate change. Talk to your 
families about climate change. It's one of the strangest issues that we have ever faced as humanity. It's one of the most important issues. It's gonna define all of our futures and we don't talk about it because it's too big. So I urge you to join me in talking about what we're facing, facing it head on, because we can make the changes that we need to make. When, when I started campaigning, there was no internet. The first time I had a cell phone, it was because I was working for Greenpeace and they gave me a cell phone. It required its own briefcase and it was the size of a brick. Everything has changed so much in our lifetimes and it is changing right now, how we use our energy, how it is produced, and whether or not we're gonna live on a, on a livable planet. It's actually pretty exciting, the moment that we are living in. So engage with it. Thank you.